Please welcome Senator Esker. Thank you so much, and I don't make that noise. It's usually nice to make her steps. <laughs> Anyways, I want to thank uh, all of you for coming down and, and thank, uh, thank Public Interest Alberta for always allowing Friends of Medicare to participate in the many hours of conference planning, but uh, most importantly for allowing healthcare to stay at the forefront of our fight for a just and fair Alberta. Healthcare impacts each one of us, you, your children, your family, your neighbors, your grandchildren, society as a whole. The presentation we will be hearing today cannot come at a more appropriate time. Soon, we will all have the opportunity to vote for a party that hopefully, truly represents the values of equity that guided the creation of our Medicare system. <laughs> Friends of Medicare is a nonpartisan organization, but we do political advocacy. And as you heard in this morning's presentations, politics, ideologies are what set the direction that our public services and economic futures will undoubtedly take. We need to start paying attention to what is truly happening in healthcare. And we need to start paying attention to the ideology that is driving the current healthcare policies and planning. And what better way to enrich the discourse by our next uh, presenter, Colleen Fuller. I can't say enough about our speaker, other than she's an amazing activist and a lifelong health care advocate. And now I leave you with Colleen Fuller, Ideology and Health Care in Canada. Thank you, Sandra. I had uh, the pleasure of driving up to Edmonton from Lethbridge yesterday with Sandra. I didn't realize it was going to be such a long drive, but actually it turned out to be good because I really got to know her um, a lot better. And uh, so that was great. When I arrived, uh, lo and behold, there were a number of people in the bar, of course, <laughs> that, uh, that I knew, including um, Bill Moore Kilgannon, although I didn't recognize him because he was wearing a suit. So. <laughs> Um, I am just in awe of the presenters here today. They really have been um, great, really interesting. I've, and uh, I'm going to be talking about um, a kind of a similar theme, I suppose you could say, and that is the um, impact of neoliberal strategies, um, that the impact on healthcare. And neoliberalism, really, from my um, understanding of it, and I am not an, a total expert, but there are a lot of people in the world who have really looked at, at neoliberalism over the last um, 30 to 35 years. I am kind of new to this discussion in some ways and was influenced by a conference I attended in Belgium in December 2013. And the theme of the conference was, in fact, neoliberalism and health reform in Europe and Latin America, which was completely appropriate uh, because the, the testing ground for a lot of neoliberal strategies was in, in Chile. And from Chile, it just spread right across Latin America and is now, of course, spreading throughout um, the European throughout Europe and also um, in, in North America, but of course the origins of a lot of that was the Chicago School of Economics. Um, and that's what we are really uh, beginning to experience in Canada, and it is really scary from my perspective, the, the kind of um, havoc that these strategies can play in, in people's personal lives, in our communities, and across the, and in our country as a whole. Um, from my perspective, neoliberalism is a strategy specifically in the service of capitalism. And I think that one of the things that came out of the conference I was at in Belgium is that we have to name what the problem is. And yes, neoliberalism is a, a tool, and that is a big problem, but we have to start looking at the economies that this um, ideology is being placed in service of, and that is the, um, of course, capitalist economy, and that's the kind of economy that we have. So I'm going to be talking about um, two uh, 
uh, neoliberal tools that have been implemented in Canada and that are having an impact on healthcare in ways that we see and also ways that we don't see necessarily. One is the um, sort of cult of individual rights and, and uh, uh, so-called consumer choice. This is really making it very, very, this is a challenge for those of us who are working in healthcare, who are campaigning in healthcare, and are, um, are completely um, going in another direction where we are fighting for collective entitlement. And, and in the, the whole argument around individual rights and consumer choice is undermining from our perspective, the, the principle of social solidarity and collective entitlement in Canada. The second um, lever that is being employed um, in the service of capitalism and is a neoliberal strategy is global free trade and trade liberalization. And this also, we I don't think that we in Canada have done enough work on the impact of free trade and actually what has happened. We know that there's increased privatization, we know that there are things that are happening, but we need to take a much deeper look at what is going on. I'm going to do a little bit of that, I hope, today, and um, and so so that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I uh, am not a big fan of the Harper government, and I doubt there are very many people here. <laughs> You know, the Harper um, Conservatives, they made hardly any commitment to health care in the 2011 election. And if they had, they would have, you know, done exactly the opposite of whatever commitment they had made. Um, and that, they, but they did make one commitment, and that commitment was to work collaboratively with the provinces and territories to renew the health court and continue to, um, to reduce wait times across the country. They have done none of that. They have, they're not working collaboratively with the provinces and territories. They haven't renewed the health accord, and they're not helping anybody reduce wait times. So strike three, and let's hope they're out in October. Yeah. What they have done, um, in, you know, just completely in a unilateral way, is to reduce uh, cash transfers to the provinces over the next 10 to 12 years by $36 billion. They're reducing the annual increase in cash transfers by 43%. There was an escalator, of, an annual escalator of 6% is being reduced to 3.9%. And they are, the federal government is um, aiming to reduce its federal contribution to public health expenditures to 12%. So think about this in relation to the experiences that we've had over the last 25 to 30 years. During the Mulroney and Chrétien years, so over a period I would say of about 13 years or so, the um, federal government reduced cash transfers to the provinces by $36.5 billion, and that is in 1995 dollars. So in today's dollars, that would be $25 billion. So you compare that to the $36 billion that Harper is planning um, over the next decade or so um, in uh, reducing uh, cash transfers. At the end of uh, the 90s, in 1999, the federal contribution to total public health expenditures was at 18%. So we know that these steps that are being taken by the federal government, we have a, a kind of a, a, an inkling of what the impact is going to be. During those years, the 80s and, well, the 90s really, we saw hospital closures, bed reductions, we saw staff reductions across the country in every single province without exception. And, and, and that was at a level that is not um, as uh, devastating in my view as the current uh, cuts that are coming down the pipe very, very shortly. In fact, they're starting very, very soon. This is being done um, not because, as a lot of governments will argue, that uh, the government has no choice, that this is what they have to do. This is the choice that, that uh, this federal government has made. And, um, you know, Maggie Thatcher always used to say there is no alternative. And, a lot of people rejected that in England during those years, and 
um, and, and continue to reject it. And that's something that I think that we have to get our heads around, that there are, there are absolutely and definitely alternatives. And I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about some of the things I think that we need um, to do ourselves to get that into people's minds, that there are, in fact, alternatives. The 1980s, which is where I'm going to sort of start with, um, was a, a real decade of change in Canada and also internationally. It was a, a decade when that experiment, uh, the Chilean neoliberal experiment, really began to be diffused around the world. And in healthcare, the World Bank in 1990 produced a, a report, and it was basically saying this is the recipe that all countries should follow in regard to health reform, and it included uh, things like things that had happened in Chile. Regionalization was one of them. In other words, undermining the central authority of government in in the health arena, privatization, the introduction of uh, creating opportunities for the private sector to invest in healthcare, introducing user fees. And, and essentially introducing a private tier into the health care system. So th this is a recipe that was, was um, articulated by the World Bank. And of course, the countries that depended on World Bank money are the countries that were on the front lines of, in, of, of introducing a lot of these types of policies. Um, the other um, tool that the, was recommended by the World Bank were trade agreements, so that all of these changes that would occur in a country would actually be locked in forever and that an, another government that was elected would not be able to reverse the changes that had been made by, by the, the previous government. And so this is what, uh, what we're, we're seeing in Canada. Um, the, in the 19, so the 1980s were this kind of uh, weird period. The Canada Health Act was introduced in 1984. And from my perspective, in looking at, at that period, the Canada Health Act, it's a very effective tool for us to use to defend Medicare. But it was an, anom an anomaly in the 1980s. Because there were two other things that happened that have had a huge impact on healthcare, not just on healthcare, but on other parts of our economy. One was the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And the Charter um, was... Um, what the Charter did was bring the issue of individual rights into the health policy arena and of course, as we're now seeing, into the courts. And so this is the idea that um, it's my money, I should be able to use it how I want, the state doesn't have any right to tell me how to spend my dollar. If I want to spend it on health care, I have a right to do that and the Constitution says I have a right. And they're arguing this because we live in a capitalist society where in fact you do have a right to spend your money the way that you want to, and the state doesn't tell you how you should or should not spend it. So that is basically what the argument is with the Charter. And the Charter, unfortunately, has become, um, in, in health care, has become a tool, really, to maintain class privilege in Canada, and um, mainly class privilege from my perspective. So the Charter was introduced in 1982, the Canada Health Act in 1984, and in 1987, after running on a platform that said I would never sign a free trade deal, Brian Mulroney signed a free trade deal in 1987. And I'm sure everybody in this room remembers that. Um, the, um, the idea of this trade deal was to bolster corporate rights, and that's exactly what's happened in, in Canada, and of course all of the subsequent trade deals as well. I'm not going to get into all of the trade deals, I'm mainly going to talk about global trade uh, in a generic way, but, uh, but the signing of the 1987 deal brought, um, where the Charter brought individual rights into the policy arena, the trade deal bought, brought corporations to the health policy table in a very real way, and, that's, and we're experiencing some of that now. So, corporate and individual rights are two sides of the same neoliberal coin. And the, the, that uh, um, coin relies on a, on a formula that, in, that basically involves um, um, defunding uh, public services and creating space for corporations to step into the picture. 
and promoting a culture of consumer choice and individual rights. So all of these things have a relationship and they play together um, and, the, and we're really seeing that in healthcare. So the charter um, has had mixed results. As I said, it was you know when it was introduced in 1982, the idea was that uh, that certain groups, women, people with disabilities, racialized groups, um, the LGBT community would be able to use the charter to test the constitutionality of laws that discriminated against them in one way or another. And um, in 1992. I think it was 1992, 10 years um, after the charter was introduced, an organization was founded by the name of the Canadian Constitution Foundation, and I'm sure most of you know uh, the group I'm talking about. The, the CCF, and I'm sorry about the acronym, but that's what it is, um, they, they were founded with one goal in mind, and that was to get rid of the court challenges program, which had been set up by the Liberals, to enable all of these organizations to do this testing of the Constitution. They were publicly funded constitutional challenges, and, and so that was sort of part of the general strategy. So the Canadian Constitution Foundation said that this is t totally wrong, it's a waste of public money, blah, blah. And when Harper was elected, one of the first things he did, of course, was to dump the court challenges program. And so essentially it was a privatization of all of the testing of our Constitution, because the Canadian Constitution Foundation, which is championed by the Koch brothers, which I know in Alberta um, run a lot of, are kind of hovering in the background. Actually, they run, what do they run? The tar sands. Um, but anyway, um, uh, they're, they're, the Canadian Constitution Foundation is really being supported by some of these really extreme right-wing organizations, and certainly the Koch brothers are, are among those. Um, so, um, one of the things that we, so the first uh, charter challenge was in 1985, and it was so a year after the Canada Health Act. How many people here knew that? 1985. So that was the Canadian Medical Association, and they, representing doctors, went to uh, the court, they filed a complaint and said, that the, chart, that the Canada Health Act violated their charter rights to charge patients anything that they thought should, the patient should be charged for, their, for physician services. And at the time, in the 1980s, including in Alberta, actually, there was a huge hostility towards anybody who advocated extra billing. And so the CMA decided to drop, uh, after about a year, I think, they dropped the charter challenge because they didn't want to look greedy. They wanted to look principled. So they withdrew the charter challenge. Um, in 2006, there were, or in 1999, there was a charter challenge in Quebec, which most of you will be familiar with. Jacques Chauly and uh, um, George Zeliotis went to the courts and they challenged the ban on private insurance for services covered under the public system. They um, eventually ended up in the Supreme Court of Canada and they, they uh, had a partial victory. The Supreme Court said that the ban on private insurance violated the charter rights but the, under the Quebec Charter, but did not violate their rights under the Canadian Charter. So that was the decision. It was a really unfortunate decision. It's had a very, very bad impact. And in fact, um, one of the things that's happening that's sort of interesting in Quebec right now is that although um, uh, for people who need hip, knee, or eye surgery, if they've been waiting for longer than six months, they're able to purchase private insurance. Unfortunately, the people who need hips, knees, and eyes are mostly over 65, and this is an uninsurable group, and the insurance industry is entitled, they have an exemption under the Human Rights Act to discriminate on the basis of age, sex, and disability. So if you have uh, an existing condition, in fact, in Alberta, uh, a number of years ago, there was a woman who tried to get a life insurance policy, and she was denied the insurance policy because her mother had had breast cancer and that's considered to be a pre-existing condition. So, so this is the reality of the Canadian, um, of, of the Canadian private insurance industry in Canada and the rights that they have to discriminate against people. And they also, of course, discriminate on the basis of ability to pay their very high premiums. 
So um, that was an unfortunate decision. Now in Quebec, there's a class action lawsuit being launched against uh, doctors and private uh, medical clinics that are extra billing illegally. <laughs> so it's a total mess. But uh, so in 2006, two other charter challenges were launched. One in Ontario by uh, two people, one of whom is a woman named Shona Holmes, who some of you may remember was enlisted by Americans for Prosperity in the United States, which is the Koch brothers' outfit, <coughs> to campaign against Obamacare. And she, she said that she had a brain tumor. She couldn't get, she would have died if she had been on the wait list in Ontario, so she had to go to the United States and spend a lot of money. And she, um, and that, so Americans should be warned about uh, Canadian style health care. Of course, she didn't have a brain tumor. She, um, she, had uh, another condition which was was not uh, life-threatening and so forth and so on. I'm not saying that wait times are great in Canada, don't get me wrong, but she totally misrepresented what was going on. I'm going to move this down a bit so I can... Um, so uh, she uh, has a class action, or pardon me, a charter challenge which is uh, still pending. And um, in this province there was a fellow by the name of Darcy Allen who also launched a charter challenge because he spent $70,000 to get back surgery in the U.S. He wanted to, the Alberta um, Health Service to reimburse him. They said no, and so um, off he went to court, and the, his case is being thrown out, and now John Carke, who is one of the co-founders of the Canadian Constitution Foundation, and I think is a total nutbag, is uh, <laughs> headed to court <laughs> on his behalf, or it's appealing. So, um, so those are, um, are four charter challenges that have been launched and for a variety of reasons. The, the fifth charter challenge is the most serious. And I'm sorry to tell you that this is the one that's taken place in, in British Columbia where I come from. And it was launched um, in 2009 by five private surgical clinics, including Cam the Canby Surgeries Corporation and uh, False Creek Surgery, which is now owned by Centric Health. And, uh, all of the surgical clinics withdrew because they also were worried that they could look like a bunch of greedy you-know-whats. And so all of the companies left except for Canby. And another uh, one of uh, Day's, Brian Day's um, uh, clinics has joined along with five patients. And the patients are, um, four of the patients that are included in the uh, lawsuit now were patients at Canby Surgery, and they all had their fees waived by Canby Surgery, and then uh, prior to the time that they became plaintiffs in the case. So this is, uh, and I'm not, as I said, I'm not saying that these patients don't have legitimate concerns, but the remedies that they're asking the courts to provide, which is to allow, Brian Day has a spin on this case, and I'm sure you've heard it. People, you know, have a right, should be able to use their money to, to get the services that they need if they've been waiting a long time in pain. And that is the spin that he has, has put out there. However, unfortunately, that is not what the claim is that he's made, that he's filed in the courts. The claim is that doctors have a right to charge patients. Um, they have a right to charge patients. They have a right to charge the public insurance system. They have a right to charge the private insurance system. And it doesn't matter whether you've been waiting five months or five minutes. And that is exactly what that claim says. Um, it doesn't say it in those words, but <laughs> that's basically where, where they're headed. Um, the patients in, in this case are people who uh, felt that they were waiting too long for surgery. And there's one in particular uh, young uh, a man who is uh, has very severe scoliosis and, and uh, for reasons that are not entirely clear was waiting for a very long time before his mother went to the United States with him to get this surgery and with a very bad outcome. So, uh, so the problem is that the overwhelming evidence both internationally and in Canada indicates that these that the remedy that that these people are seeking in the court is a contributor to long wait times, and that is enabling, uh, establishing a, a, a second tier so that people with money or with private insurance can obtain services more quickly than they would be able to in the public system. And the evidence shows that that doesn't shorten wait times in the public system. In fact, those wait times get much longer. And so, so that, and of course, the whole situation with private insurance also is a, is a bit of a problem. 
but uh, so so this is um, this is the uh, challenge that is confronting people in BC, but it also is a challenge for people in Alberta, for people in Saskatchewan, for people in every single province in Canada. Because if Brian Day wins in BC, of course, um, hopefully it would be appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada. But like every other single charter challenge, it has been all about the ability to pay and to access care on, on the basis of ability to pay and not on the basis of need. And it is undermining, the, the remedies that are being sought in the court is undermining, as I said, the ability of the public system and, and uh, uh, to respond to people on the basis of need. And I should say that, the, that litigating health rights is not just happening in Canada, it's happening internationally as well. And um, people may be familiar with, and it's not for healthcare only, but it, it's also access to pharmaceuticals. So healthcare and access to pharmaceuticals has resulted in a number of litigations internationally. Um, South Africa was, is, is an example that you may be familiar with. People wanted access to HIV drugs and had to go through the courts to, to get that access. Um, unfortunately, in almost every case where there's been a, a, a kind of a, a challenge, a constitutional challenge or whatever, uh, to health in the area of health rights, the people who have benefited have been the people with money. And that is exactly the outcome that we will see if Brian Day and Canby Surgeries Corporation win the case um, in D.C. And, and at the Supreme Court level, the Canada Supreme Court. So. The other, um, one of the things that I think is um, contributing to this sort of idea of individual rights actually is um, as a result of the expansion of corporate rights in healthcare because um, privatization limits people's access to healthcare and we've seen in, across the country the, the delisting of services, the the um, making it more difficult for people to access care in the hospital system, in fact narrowing the interpretation of health law in Canada so that instead of the principle of access to needed health care services, we now hear over and over again that, this, that we only have access to doctors in hospitals. But in fact, when the debates were happening around the Canada Health Act, that was never the intention of that legislation. And when it was introduced, in fact, there used to be a federal transfer for what were referred to as extended health services, and that meant home care, things like home care, things like uh, outpatient physiotherapy, all of these types of services were funded federally, not entirely, but there was, some, there, there was a dedicated transfer for these services. And so in 1996, guess what? There was an amendment to the Canada Health Act and those transfers were eliminated. So this is something that's um, created this space for private companies to become involved. And of course, Lifemark, which is uh, very well known in Alberta, is the biggest outpatient rehab company provider, the biggest outpatient rehab provider in the country. and, and uh, it, it, is, it is one of the companies that was aided and abetted by American dollars coming into Canada because of the free trade deal. So the Charter brought um, individual rights into the picture and we're dealing with that um, now. And it, the free trade agreement in 1987, of course, brought corporate rights to the same table. And um, the, the NAFTA, the WTO, all of the other trade deals, the pending ones, CETA, um, which hasn't been uh, signed off yet. All these agreements are having a very, very bad impact on, on our ability to, um, to manage our healthcare system in the public interest. Now, where did all this come from? Did it just kind of drop out of the sky? No. In fact, um, prior to the Mulroney government signing the first free trade deal, in 1986, the Conservatives enlisted the Fraser Institute to help them figure out what what, how, the way forward in, in health care. They had the Canada Health Act because it had been pa passed by the Liberals, but the Mulroney government was the first government to implement the agreement. And so in 1986, the uh, Fraser Institute um, um, 
take, provided a report, was paid to give them a, a report on Canada's future growth and competitiveness in healthcare. And of course, they were all, like their eyes were just dazzled by the $3 trillion global healthcare market that was in the 1980s and that's all, and 1990s. And that's what you heard over and over and over and over again. And the Fraser Institute was the author of this, this line of reasoning. The, the Canada had um, an international reputation in excellence in healthcare at that time for a very, very cost-effective system with very, very high-quality services. And so the reasoning was that what are we doing wasting our reputation on a public system? We could be out there making a killing in the global market. And that was basically the reasoning of the Mulroney government. Um, so the, the um, rationale in part was provided by the Fraser Institute. After the Conservatives lost the election, the Liberals followed the same song sheet word for word for word for word, and in fact were responsible for implementing a lot of the changes that, that uh, were unwound. And, and there, there were four uh, changes that um, happened as a result of this idea that we needed to develop a domestic market in Canada, because we were plagued with problems, such as most providers were nonprofit, and if you're a nonprofit provider, how can you be a big player in the global market? And that really was almost word for word what what the reasoning was um, that we had to have a domestic launching pad into the into the into the global market, but we had to develop it, and we didn't have the money in Canada to develop this domestic launching pad, so we had to welcome in foreign capital. And the free trade agreement was one of the levers to bring in foreign capital to help Canada develop a domestic healthcare market, a launching pad for Canadian companies into the global market. Um, so that was uh, a major contribution of the Fraser Institute. So, um, so one of the there there were four things that came out of that. One was the introduction of competitive tendering in in healthcare, which had not been um, really used in the health sector in any significant way at all. The second was contracting out, the third was uh, public-private partnerships, and the fourth was cross-border investment or international investment. Those four things have all had an impact on our healthcare system, and I know that you're all saying, yes, I know that's true, and, and so forth and so on, because it is true. Um, The funding cuts were instrumental in, in, um, in enabling some of this uh, to happen. One of the things that, the, um, that Industry Canada advised Canadian companies who, were, who they said, you're going to be under free trade, you're going to be competing with foreign <coughs> multinationals, so you better get your shit together and figure out how you're going to win these bids because they're all being tendered now. So you will have to learn how to participate in a competitive tendering process. Um, and, of course, the only bids that win are the ones that are the low bids, right? So you will have to learn or have to develop a strategy to submit low bids. And guess what the strategy was that was recommended by Industry Canada? It was, um, you, would, you will have to lower uh, production costs. And that, of course, in healthcare means what? Labor. So, um, so under the advice and encouragement of uh, Industry Canada, one of the things that began to happen is this culture in healthcare of low bid, low tenders, and so forth and so on. The first group actually that felt the impact of this was in home care, interestingly enough. In Ontario, they introduced competitive tendering in, in home care, and it resulted in the total wipeout of the Victorian Order of Nurses, which um, in the 1990s reached the age of 100, and, um, and the Victorian Order of Nurses was wiped out, but another company was very successful, and that was the Olsen Corporation, based in New Jersey, that was able to win um, quite a number of the of the bids. And if the if Alston lost a bid, they would go to Argentina or Ohio or wherever 
Um, but if the Victorian Order of Nurses lost, which they did, they had nowhere to go and they lost, um, they lost their bid. Now the way that, indus that Industry Canada managed this, in, the, in 1999, or 19, actually 1996, they began convening a number of round tables with the nonprofit sector, and they wanted to change the relationship between the federal government and the nonprofit sector in Canada. And so, um, at that time, most of the groups that provided health and social services in Canada received core funding from both federal and provincial governments, and that was very important and enabled them to be flexible, more responsive to the communities in which they functioned, and so forth and so on. Um, Industry Canada said this is this is sort of like enslaving the poor nonprofit sector because uh, it it will probably inhibit you from speaking um, and criticizing the government which is funding you. So if you got contracts instead of being, uh, getting uh, core funding, you'll be, be much more free to criticize the government, <laughs> and that is really what they said. Um, so the the nonprofit sector wasn't very happy about that, but that's exactly what happened. And so um, competitive tender became the, the order of the day. Um, and, it, and it has played havoc. Not only have a lot of nonprofits gone under because of this change in, in funding methodology, but it also, one of the requirements under NAFTA um, that is that uh, is part of the competitive tendering process is that if you win a tender, you have to demonstrate commercial viability. Well, a nonprofit is not really a commercial organization. Um, it doesn't have those uh, commercial. It doesn't have a commercial orientation. So, but they have had to adopt that. So that means that if you're a home care provider, you're not going to be. Pro providing uh, bathing for half an hour, you're going to be doing it for 15 minutes. And that's exactly what's been going on, not just in home care, but right across some of, some of that uh, outpatient sector. The other uh, contracting authority in Canada, of course, is hospitals. And hospitals um, have also utilized competitive tendering in order to contract out services. Now, you know, the, the, the mythology was that this was going to benefit Canadian companies, the launching pad, blah, blah, the world market, $3 trillion. <laughs> um, but the people who have benefited from this um, contracting out and the competitive tendering process in the hospital sector have been foreign multinationals, almost to the letter. So Aramark, Sodexo, Compass, um, none of those, those are the three big companies in the hospital sector in Canada, and none, none, none of them are based in Canada, they're based in England, the United States, and France. So these corporations have, have really benefited. And of course, uh, I don't have to tell you about P3s, which is just a total transfer of risk to the public sector and a transfer of public money to the private uh, corporations. So the question is, um, you know, these things are, are playing out now. I mean, I'm talking about the 1990s, but um, one of the big companies in, in Alberta and in, and in Canada, an emerging corporation, is Centric Health. And uh, pe are people here familiar with Centric? Well, Centric uh, is uh, um, founded by, uh, well, the, the driver behind Centric is a guy named Jack Chevelle, who, who set up a company in South Africa in the 1980s, I think it was, called Netcare. And NetCare was a small surgical clinic in Johannesburg and is now the largest private hospital corporation in Europe. And the person who piloted that company to this uh, fame and fortune is this fellow, Jack Chevelle. Jack Chevelle doesn't live in Canada, he lives in San Diego, but he has a venture capital fund which is feeding money into Centric, which is now growing. It purchased LifeMark. Um, um, in 2011, I think it was, and has a, a surgical, I think more than one surgical facility in Alberta. They own False Creek Health in Vancouver and Winnipeg and Ontario, etc. They are they are a booming company, and they are a real threat on the Canadian healthcare landscape. So this has been enabled by um, the in, by the infl inflow of foreign capital into a Canadian company which is now on the acquisition trail and is purchasing private surgical clinics, long-term care, pharmacies, you name it, they're purchasing it. And so we will have to deal with this way, this company. There are no regulations 
um, in some parts of the healthcare system governing this company. And I was interested in what you were saying about regulation. We, we don't have a lot of regulation in healthcare, um, in the private healthcare market, and it's a challenge for us because we have to decide if we are going to be pushing for regulations of these companies, which are breaking the law, they're extra billing people, they're charging facility fees illegally, um, whether we want them to be regulated, and if we don't regulate them, then what? What, what, is, what is our strategy around these companies? It's a big challenge, and I, I, don't have, I have my own personal opinions about it. I think we should get rid of them. In fact, we should take them over. Um, so I want to talk for just a few minutes about some of the things that um, I think we need to think about doing. As I said, I think that the, the problem, and, and certainly this is something I was so impressed with this conversation in Antwerp in 2013, that um, there was a lot of discussion, a lot of debate, a lot of disagreement, and so forth. But, but basically there was a recognition that that these strategies are being implemented in the service of, of capitalism. And so a lot of the people in Southern Europe were saying that is the problem. The problem is capitalism and we have to focus on that. I don't think we're there in Canada quite yet. I think that we need to be building a movement in order to get to that place. But, but, but basically I agree. I agree with that perspective. Um, in the meantime, I think that we need to confront a reality in Canada, which is that, as Murray, Murray Dobbin has written so well, that Canadians have high hopes and low expectations. And that is why we elect governments who promise to do things, but we never really expect them to follow through, and that's the kind of government we get. So, um, so we need to begin developing a movement which will raise people's expectations in health care. Um, I think that, uh, and in the, media, in the immediate thing, I think that it's got to be a total all-out mo mobilization against this uh, charter challenge in BC, because all of our interests are at stake on the outcome of that court decision. And it's going to be, it's scary. There's a lot of people worried that we're not going to win that case. And if we don't win that case, we can kiss Medicare goodbye. So we have to begin mobilizing across the country to make sure that doctors do not have the right to charge whatever they want, and that private corporations don't have the charge have the right to charge you for acts for the operating room rental, for the nursing uh, staff wages, for this, that, and Kleenex, aspirins, and you name it. This is not uh, the kind of system that we need in Canada or want, and and so we really have to start mobilizing around that. And I don't mean just the healthcare unions either. I mean everybody. But the other thing I think that we need to do um, as uh, Medicare campaigners, I have 10 minutes left, but I'm almost done, don't worry. Um, I also think that we need, we, we, even if we win the battle in Medicare, this, the system isn't going to be sustainable. And you know why? Because there's such a thing as called social determinants of health. And that means that people who live in poverty are more susceptible and experience higher rates of heart disease, diabetes, and other uh, problems related to mental stress and distress. That is a reality, and our poverty rates are going up in Canada. We have people who are living downstream from the tar sands who are experiencing increased um, incidence of cancers that are related to the tar sands. And so if we don't get on that bandwagon, those people are going to be turning also to the healthcare system. We have, um, I, I've been very active in the women's health movement, and you know, the women's health movement campaigned for treatment for breast cancer. We have, in North America, we have the highest rates of breast cancer in the world. Why is that? Because we have some of the highest rates of estrogen being dumped into the environment. And so this is one of the consequences, is the high rate of, of breast cancer being experienced amongst women on this continent. So we can't afford, in the women's health movement, to say we need treatment. And there is a really growing voice in the women's health movement that we need to start addressing the real thing, which is the cause of breast cancer. We don't just need treatment, we need to end the triggers that are resulting in these escalated incidents. Autism. Autism, the rate of aut autism is skyrocketing, and there are a number of studies that are showing that this is linked to air toxins. So 
in our Medicare, as we're campaigning for Medicare, we have to begin, we won't, we won't win the fight for Medicare alone, but not, neither will any of these other struggles. The struggle for social justice, the struggle for economic justice, the struggle for climate justice, these are not going to win their struggles on their own either, and, it, and a number of speakers have already said this. We have to start connecting the dots, and we have a voice on the healthcare issue, and we have a lot of knowledge to bring to the struggle. We also are one of the movements in Canada that has been the most successful in staying the hand of, of those people who are trying to disentitle us from one of the most important social uh, it's not a social program, it's a public program. One of the most dear loved and important public programs in the country. So we have a lot of leadership that we can bring to these other movements. We have a lot of knowledge about the impact of poverty, of, of, of racism, um, of sexism, of the uh, bad climate uh, um, environmental policies. We have knowledge about this and we need to bring that as a voice into, into the struggles for, in, in all of these other areas and begin uniting our struggles um, across the board. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Colleen. Um, you know, we get any message out of uh, her her uh, presentation is that is the fact that we definitely need to have political will to address the issues behind. Um, determinants of health and, and health care uh, within our province. So thank you so much. And I told her not to make eye contact with Bill because he likes to put up signs, um, but she did. So that allows us to actually uh, open the uh, floor for some questions. We have time for about three or so questions, so we'll take... No, I think you That's what the problem is, and the, you know the cash uh, transfers to the provinces. They have, they are often, and I've described it as a club. You know that no cash, no compliance, no cash, and and that is when the provinces. You know the the fear was that with no cash, the provinces were going to say no cash, no compliance. But um, but I think that federal transfers have to be seen as an enabler. You know, the, not only did uh, Harper, uh, the Harper government, um, not only has it gutted the cash transfers, but it also removed one of the really important features of, of uh, the relationship between the federal government and the provinces, which is equity. And so um, those equity transfers were very, very important for all provinces, except Alberta, um, apparently. And, uh, um, but they leveled the playing field so that um, that high national standards can be maintained without it pl placing an extraordinary burden on any one part of the country because we're not all equal in terms of economic capacity and so forth and so on. And that also is gone. I think that, that the real problem here is that the federal government, it doesn't want health care. It's no secret that Harper is, has been hostile to Medicare right from whenever it was with the National Citizens Coalition in Alberta. 
and that his objective has been to destroy Medicare and to open up the market to the uh, pri to private corporations and not necessarily Canadian corporations either. But so that that is what the problem is. That is the problem, and I think that we have to put the. Um, the end of transfers within that context, and I think the same problem happened with the Christian liberals as well. I thought I think that they believed that Medicare should be um, sort of like a catastrophic um, health plan, right? And and in fact, uh, Christian said that that it wasn't designed to give care to everybody. It was designed to give care to people who were on on death's doorstep, and that was the you know, um, that was the way that they looked at it. And the changes that they implemented during the 1990s have helped us move in that direction, I have to say. Thank you, Colleen. Uh, thank you. Neil Evans here. Um, I'd just like to say thank you for reminding us that we cannot afford to take our health care system for granted. Uh, some of us in this room are old enough to remember the 1960s First of all, when the Saskatchewan government introduced the Medicare program and the doctors went on strike because they, they saw it as an imposition on their rights to practice medicine uh, without government interference, and the Saskatchewan government prevailed. And then we had Medicare introduced into Canada, and with, within days or weeks, nine provinces signed on, one province didn't. That province was Alberta. The premier of that province was Ernest Manning. His son is Preston Manning. There is a straight line from Ernest Manning through Preston Manning to Stephen Harper. And we have to uh, always keep that in mind. We were rallied in the 1990s when our health care system was under attack in a variety of ways and in the early 2000s. Um, some of us in this room, I recognize faces, I know some people, um, spoke strongly and forcefully. There was a rally of 5,000 people on the grass on the north side of the um, Grey Nuns Hospital when Rail Plain tr tried to close it. There was a rally of thousands of people on the north side of the Alberta Legislative Building. Um, and it looks like we're going to have to be prepared to do those kinds of things again. Um, and I hope we do, because we cannot let we cannot lose this healthcare system. Thank you. We only have, oh, sorry, oh, go sorry. ahead. Um, I just wanted to add that um, in the 90s, when those 5,000 people were on the lawn of the legislature, it was quite a different time, of course, than it is now. One of the things that's happened in the intervening years is that the number of um, employees in Alberta with extended health benefits has plummeted. So Alberta, BC, and Prince Edward Island have the lowest um, number of people with extended health benefits in the country. I think in Alberta it's about 38%, BC it's 36%, and PEI it's about 33%, compared to 73% in Ontario, 78% in Newfoundland, etc. So the disparities in the country are, are greater, of course, in the private, system, private uh, health insurance system. But that means that people, the idea that people are going to get health insurance is just like stupid and, and uh, people aren't going to get health insurance. The sector that's been the most adversely affected by this plunge in coverage, in fact, are unionized workers. And so that's another thing that the labor movement better get its head around because they are losing benefits, they're not getting them. And so the dependency on the public system is acute right across the workforce and that needs to be an organizing issue. Can we have a vote? One minute left for another question, Annette. It's just a, it's a comment I want to bring to Colleen, that in terms of the, the federal government and the transfer of the payments and the health accord, Alberta government does not want a health accord. They don't, they're quite happy 
with just getting the money they're getting and they know what's going to go down, but that's okay because they have other plans for that. But they are happy that there isn't a health accord that gives the federal government any role in looking at what happens in Alberta. That is the way they want it. So it's a something to raise in terms of our upcoming provincial election and what kind of health care you know, vision politicians have here in the province, but also in the federal election that's going to happen this year. It is very important that, in fact, we say we want politicians in this province who will support things like a national-led pharmacare program, right? Not this election and in the next election. Federal. Thank you so much, Heather, Heather for Premier. <laughs> anyway, as, as Alex Himmelfarb always says, you know, austerity and cuts in, in, in any kind of public service um, leave us without hope, and they leave us without creativity. And I think it's, it's through people like Colleen that we regain that, that hope that things can be different and that we can make a difference with the advocacy that we do with the work that all of you, all your organizations and, and you as individuals put forward to make sure that Alberta is in fact a, a just and fair place for all of us to live in. So I just want to thank Colleen for making um, the trip down to visit us and give her a little bit of a token of our appreciation. Thank you, Colleen, and thank you, Sandra, Friends of Medicare, for sponsoring that. Now it's...